I'm talking about the love of the Father. I want to do something a little differently today and talk about Joshua with the love of the Father. So we're going to stay on there. So we're going to do Joshua 1. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray that you continue to move mightily in this service as you as you have been throughout the praise and worship, Lord. We thank you what you're doing in here. We thank you what you're doing in the lives of your people, God. Give them a fresh word. Give them a word, God, that'll penetrate their heart and bring change to their life. And we give you all the praise and honor for it right now. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Joshua 1. Very familiar passage. We're going to go through the whole chapter. We're going to be pretty quick about it, too, at the same time. You know Joshua, right? Everyone knows Joshua? Slave. He was a soldier. He was a seeker after God's presence. He was a servant for Moses. He was one of the spies that went in there with Caleb and came back with a good report. He was a forerunner. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Joshua 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses. Moses, my servant, is dead. So now go, get up and cross over the Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I am giving to the children of Israel. I have given you every place that the sole of your foot shall tread. As I said to Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the Mediterranean Sea, toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand against all your days, all of your life. They will not be able to stand against you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. Let's stop there. So Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. It's the, uh, his name is the equivalent for Yeshua. As you know, Joshua succeeded Moses and he was from the tribe of Ephraim, which that tribe was called being fruitful. Joshua's whole role was bringing the children of Israel into a rest, into the promised land. He's a type of Jesus. And he's also, through Rahab the Scar and the Scarlet Cord, are clear pictures of salvation, of the very love of God through the blood of Jesus. So we see that already in, in Joshua. And it was in Gilgal, later on in the book, that he rolled away the reproach of Egypt from his people. If you, look at, if you look just into chapter 1, you'll see the love of the Father, you'll see the encouragement of the Father, and you'll also see the faithfulness of the Father. So today, the Father loves you, as you've heard also in your exhortation earlier. And He is with you in your journey, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to show how God is with you every step of your life, every step of your journey, every step that He has for you, God is with you. And He always has your good in mind. So there's four R's in Joshua that I've seen as God has been taking me through this passage. The first one that I see here is in refocus. So these are the first um, few verses. And drop, drop it down to verse 6 and through 9. It says, Be strong and courageous, for you shall provide the land that I swore to the fathers to give them as an inheritance for this people. Be strong and very courageous, as a second time, in order to act carefully in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn aside from it from the right or to the left, that you may succeed wherever you go. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you act carefully according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and you will be wise. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So that's the same exhortation that Moses gave Joshua in Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 and 8. He told him to be strong and courageous then. And each time in these verses 6 through 9 where God says be strong and courageous to Joshua, he gave them an action with the word be strong and courageous. The first one he says be strong and courageous and provide. Provide the land that I swore to my fathers. The next one he said act. And the third one he said go. So each time God is encouraging Joshua, and Joshua is a mighty man, a mighty soldier, but God felt the need at, at times to encourage Joshua. So how many of us going in our battles and our life and everything that we're going through, how many times do we need that encouragement? That even though we feel strong, we've had victory after victory, but at times God will say, listen, be strong and courageous for your next battle, because there's always something else. There's no, there's no neutral in the kingdom of God. We're always moving forward. We're always going to the next step. And God is always encouraging. He's always got your back and saying, be strong and courageous. Amen? 
So here we're beginning to see God's redeeming love. Joshua's commission. Joshua, he's fighting with the Canaanites. He conquers the land. He subdues the enemy. He takes the land out of their hands. He delivers to the children of Israel. And he parcels out the land to each tribe and family and at their, their portion. So that's what Joshua was commissioned to do. And before he could do that, he had to have the enemy dispossess their land. So that's a picture of Christ's redeeming work and his people taking us out of the hands of the enemy and offering us salvation. We don't have like a promised land per se, but we have a land of promises. And God is redeeming. He bought us back. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous in order to act carefully. And it says, do not turn from the right hand or to the left, so you may prosper wherever you go. You want to know how to prosper? then you, you do what the Bible says to do. You, your obedience equals your success. And this is the first word that success is actually used in the Old Testament, in these scriptures here in Joshua. It's listening to the instructions of the Lord. And what he means by do not turn to the right or to the left is do not add words or take words from it. Verse 8. So we are looking at the book of the law must not depart from your mouth, but meditate on it. That you may succeed wherever you go. This book of the law is not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so you may act carefully according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful and you will be wise. So God is saying, read the word, keep it in front of you and speak it. That word meditate is mutter or to speak or imagine. So you need to keep putting that word inside you and keep meditating on it. And keep it in front of you. And he said, have I not commanded you to cross the Jordan and go into the land of Canaan, the land of promises? In other words, observe the law of Moses. So what was good for Moses is good for you. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. What kind of consolation does that bring to us and to them at the point that God is with them wherever they go? And in one translation, I like it says, for the help, your help is the help of the word of the Lord. So in other words, this book, this Bible is your help. Verse 11, let's jump down to verse 11. Prepare, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare food or victuals, for in three days you will cross the Jordan to take possession of the land that your Lord God is, is preparing for you. One translation, I like how it says, it says, prepare, prepare provisions. Prepare your food, your manna, and different types of food because in three days you're going to cross the Jordan. How many know three days? Doesn't that ring a bell to somebody? What happens in three days? So we're crossing the Jordan in three days. They're going to go in and possess the land. So I was watching a program with Dr. Billy Brim and her son Chip, and they were talking about a book that kind of really intrigued me. And it's uh, called The Indispensables. Sounds like a Marvel movie. But The Indispensables, and the author is uh, it's by Patrick O'Donnell. And he pointedly portrays the exploits of one of the most important military units ever to take up arms in the service of the United States of America. They were called the Marblehead Regiment, led by John Glover. And they were not just any regiment, but they were a community. They were a bunch of just people from the town. They were uncommon people who decided to take an uncommon mission. So they were people from Marblehead, Massachusetts that contributed to nearly every aspect of the American Revolution, all the drama politically, militarily, in the legislature, on the battlefield, both land and sea, one of the writers says. John Wooden said, the, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. So listen for a moment about the Marbleheaders. Let's call them the Marbleheaders for right now. This is taken directly from O'Donnell's his, uh, book, The Indispensables. On the stormy night of August 29th, 1776, the Continental Army faced capture or annihilation after losing the Battle of Brooklyn, the British had trapped George Washington's people. The entire force were against the East River. They were trapped. And the fate of the revolution rested upon the, sol the shoulders of the soldiers, and they were soldiers slash mariners from Marblehead, Massachusetts. And you know what? They pulled it off. They saved it. They saved the army by transporting the army across the treacherous waters of the river to the Manhattan. To Manhattan. The Marbleheaders played a consequential role at the right time, at the right place. They happened to be, always be at the right place at the right time. And they repeatedly altered the course of events because they prepared their provisions. They were always prepared. 
And in that, that night when they went through the, the East River over to, to Manhattan, what the Library of Congress says that there was a providential fog that screened their movements across the East River. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that neat how God, even then, was, was orchestrating the affairs of this country? So that time in history also was in the midst of a, a raging virus called smallpox. That, and that divided the entire town where the Marbleheaders were from. They were divided completely politically. Marbleheaders, though, spearheaded the break with Britain and shaped the nascent United States, the emerging United States, by playing a crucial role, governing, building alliances, seizing Brit British ships, forging critical supply lines, and establishing the origins of the U.S. Navy. But here it is. Pre say, tell your neighbor, prepare your provisions. At the most critical time in the war, the special operations like regiment, the Marbleheaders, against all odds, they conveyed and they transported 2,400 of Washington's men across the ice-filled Arctic-like Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776, delivering a momentum-shifting surprise attack on Trenton. Later, they seized the bridge at Trenton that sealed a decisive American victory that changed the course of the war. Just for people that decide to get on a purpose, they were common men from a common town, but decide to get an uncommon purpose and an uncommon mission, and they prepared for it, and they were, showed up for the battle, and they were strong, courageous, and look what happened. God is telling you today, too, I know you see yourself as common, but we serve an uncommon God that which makes you uncommon. So you have, we have an uncommon mission, and we can be successful in this uncommon mission through serving our uncommon God. And God will put, if we do our natural, God will put his supernatural on your natural. So the marble has were prepared. Joshua and yours was prepared at three days crossing. And the Lord is telling us today, just prepare. Let's jump down to verse 13. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God has given you a place for rest. And you will give this land. Your wives, your children, and your livestock may live in that land that Moses gave you on the east side of the Jordan. Remember the word. Well, what word? Numbers 32, 29, and 30. The, mo the word that Moses said earlier. He said in, in Numbers 32, If the sons of God and the sons of Reuben will cross over the Jordan with you, every man armed for battle before the Lord, and the land is subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead, east of the Jordan River, a lot of parallels here, as a possession. They were reminded, God reminded them to remember the word. But just a few verses up there, we just said, meditate on the word, keep the word in front of you, and God's already reminding them, keep the word in front of you. Remember the word they said. Interesting. What word today do you have to remember? What have you may have forgotten that God wants to say, remember the word? Remember the word that I spoke to you? The pur your purpose, your divine directive? What has God said to you in your prayer closet, in your prayer time, driving down street road? What has he said to you that you need to remember today? On this Super Bowl Sunday, when the focus is totally elsewhere, what is God telling you today, this Sunday afternoon, to remember? We remember this way as, as people today. It's, you know, remember, the, it's call to mind. It's uh, rec recollect, keep in mind for attention. You know, it's, it's bring into mind or to think of something again. But this word here in Joshua is the Hebrew word zakor. And it means to engage your faculties in the action that remembrance requires. In other words, employ your entire body, your, your mind, your, your hands, your feet, your mouth, employ everything into the action. In other words, actively recall to your mind, but secondly, act on the word of God. So it reminds you of James 1.22, not just being a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Look at the amplified version of James 1.22. It says, but be doers of the word, obey the message and not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. The message says it like this, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other, and you need to act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those 
who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. Maybe it's time today that we remember our identity in Christ. Joel 2.11, I like this. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word. There's action again with the word of God. Young's literal translation says this, and Jehovah has given forth his voice before his force, for very great is his word of life, church. For very great is his camp. For mighty is the doer of the word of God. For mighty is the doer of the word of God. Not mighty is the hearer of the word of God, but mighty is the doer of the word of God. For great is the day of Jehovah. So this is how God remembers. He doesn't just recall, he acts. When he remembered Noah, he sent a wind that subsided the waters. When God remembered his people, he sent a plan and and divided the Red Sea. When he remembered Abraham, he sent Lot out before he destroyed the cities. And God remembered Rachel and gave heed and opened up her womb. God remembered Sarah and Rachel and Hannah, and he blessed them all with with children, children. When he remembered Joseph, he took him from the pit to the palace. He remembered Jacob at Bethel. Zechariah, the prophet, whose name means the Lord remembers, the, his primary th- thrust was to remind Israel that God remembers. The whole theme of the book of Zechariah is God is going to do what he said because he always remembers. Now, you need to remember the word of God. John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. God remembered you. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God is remembering you today. And we need to remember the word of God too. If you're going through a sickness, you need to remember Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, I am healed. If you're in bondage or you can't, you're addicted to something, you got to realize John 8, 36, the son has made me free. You got to remember, I am the redeemer of the Lord. You got to remember that Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. I am, the li- I am a branch of the living vine. We need to remember the word today. Remember that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I know you, what you just did, but you remember that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, at financial problem, God supplies all our need according to riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Luke 137, we're facing impossible odds, insurmountable odds, insurmountable situations. For God, with God, nothing is impossible. Romans 10, 10, for what the mouth confession is man to salvation. Now, this is how we execute one. This is one of the ways how we execute the word of God. We recall it, recite it, and we speak it. So, see, we're blessed to be a blessing. You've heard that before. You know, you're blessed to be a blessing. Proverbs 28, 21, 20 says so. A faithful man or woman will abound with blessings. Zechariah 8, 13, so will I save you because you will be a blessing. So there you go. You were, were, we abound in blessings as a, as a man or woman, faithful, and we will be a blessing. Okay, let's go to the next word here, rest. So then Joshua's taking him into rest. Verses 13 through 15. So the Lord your God has given you a place of rest and will give you this land. How encouraging that God said, I will give you this land and I want to give you rest at the same time. Rest is to bring to a resting place, to give rest. It's Shabbat, it's the verb root, and, but this word is actually nuach, which is almost a derivative of return to the covenant. God is telling us here to return to the covenant. And Shabbat is from the Greek word sabbaton, is to take a break. How many of us need a break today? Of everything we've been through the last couple of years, wouldn't a nice break be nice? So Hebrews 4.9 says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. See, war has always been a common thread throughout the history of humanity. But at a time without war, many time of peace or completeness. The Bible calls it having rest on every side. Joshua 21, 43, 45, and also Deuteronomy 12, 8 through 11, it says, So Yahweh gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed and lived in it. And Yahweh gave them rest on every side. We need to stand on that today. We need rest on every side. I know what's going out there in the world, but in our families, in our homes, in our houses, in our churches, in our schools, we need rest. 
when he arrests on every side, according to all that he has sworn to their fathers, and no one of all the enemies stood before them. Just like we saw a few uh, verses up here in Joshua 1. No one was able to stand before them all the days of their life. Yahweh gave them all their enemies into their hand, and not one of the good promises which Yahweh had made to the house of Israel found. All came to pass. And we can't just glaze through that. Not one of the good promises which Yahweh had made to the house of Israel found. All came to pass. You need to put your name. All the promises that God put to the house of your name will come to pass. Not one of them will fail. Not one of the promises that God given you will fail. God is saying his promises are yes and amen. And he will execute his word. He will bring them to pass in your life. See, in a time of constant conflict and border wars, it seemed impossible to have rest on every side. But for a time, the Hebrews people did live in a peace and have rest from military invasion. Our rest comes from resting in him, resting in Christ. In, we rest in the word. We rest in the promises. We stop striving in our own volitions, but we enter into his rest. Hebrews 4 says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering the rest, see, it's a promise of entering his rest. For we have believed, do enter that rest. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Matthew 11 says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So if you need rest today, you need to come to the Lord, and he, will, he promises, and he will give you rest. Mark 6 says, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Mark 2, and then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That puts it in perspective, doesn't it? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And Exodus 33 says, the Lord replied, my, pro my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So you have to go to God. You have to go into his word. You have to go into this book. And you got to go, go into the New Testament and find all those scriptures that say that who are we are, who we are in Christ and who we are in him. That's where we're going to find true rest. You know, in, it says in him, we are new creations. In him, we are new creatures. In him, we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus. In him, we are made the righteousness of God. See, if we're doing this on ourselves, we don't have that kind of power. But if we're in him, if we're in Christ, now we do. And that's where we have our redemption. It says, in whom we have redemption. For the, life, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. But it's in him. 1 Corinthians 1.30, he is our righteousness. He is our wisdom. He is our sanctification. And he is our redemption. That leads us to the, to the last R, the word return. And let's just read this here real quick here. So 14, your wives, your children, your livestock may live in the land that Moses gave you on the east side of the Jordan, but you must cross over with your brothers, fully armed, your mighty men of valor, and help, well, and help them until the Lord has given your brothers rest as he has given you. They also have possessed the land that the Lord your God has given to them. Then you may return to your own land and possess what Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the east side of the Jordan where the sun rises. So the word returned, then you shall go in and return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you, this side of the Jordan, toward the sun rising. So God gave them the land. He gave them the countries of Sion and Og at the, at the, at the beginning there. And the Sion means warrior, it means king of the Amorites, and Og means gigantic king of Bashan. So those two are very significant battles, very significant lands that they had, that they had received. And when that word return means, it means to come again. It means to revisit. It returns from bondage to a state of freedom. And look at this. This word, this word return, it means to show fresh signs of mercy. Hashid. Fresh signs of God's love. Fresh signs of the Father's love. Psalm 6 says, return, O Lord, deliver my soul to come back. So right now, who needs a fresh sign of his mercy? We've been, we've been battling, we've been going forward, we've been going forward, we're working hard, working hard. We need a fresh sign of his mercy. We need that break. We need that peace. And this word re return reminds me of that word repent. And the word repent means to change one's mind and purpose. 
It's not just an academic change of mind, but it's a heartfelt transformation of one's mind and attitude and purpose. It's turning from, from sin to God. It's turning from the world to the word of God. It's turning away from sin and hate to love and forgiveness. It's turning from that passive walk to that engaged Christianity, to that engaged uh, devout discipleship. Repent to return is a first step that leads to a divine refreshing. Is there anyone today that really needs that divine refreshing? Is there anyone needs to return? So maybe you said to yourself today that, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm at. I think I've drifted away from the Lord. But God's asking you today to remember him. And God's saying today that he remembers you. He's coming down today to remember you. Right down in the service, he's walking along the aisles to you, visiting us in his presence because he's remembering you today. And he's asking you, do you need to come back to me? Do you need to return? Were you walking this way with the Lord, but now through the pandemic, you've drifted over here. And God's saying to return, come back to me. Is there anyone that would say, I want to come back to the Lord today? Why don't we just close our eyes for a second and, and just pray. God, we just ask you right now, Lord, on this Sunday, if there's anyone that needs to return to you, Lord, search our hearts, Lord. We thank you that you're remembering us, Lord. We thank you, Father, for everything that you've done for us. And God, we remember you. We remember of your word, God. And we're returning back to the book. We're returning to absolute truth, Lord. We're returning to you, Lord. Is there anyone with a show of hands that would like to receive the Lord today, wants to return to the Lord today? Does anyone want to come down to this altar and receive prayer? We'll open these altar, this altar up, and anyone wants to come down for prayer? You guys can stand up if you like. So remember... As you're going through, we don't have to, we all get these encouragements from the Lord. You don't have to have everything in place. God is with you in the battle. He's with you on the journey. And he wants you to return today. He wants you to refocus today. He wants you to remember him today. And he wants you to enter into his rest. He wants you to stop working and stressing on your own self and enter in his rest. That's where your power source is. We need to be connected to the vine, connected to the Lord Jesus. And realize that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that we are a new creation. We are those who are called for purpose in such a time as this. And we have what we need because we have God. So if you have Jesus and you have the Lord, then you have everything you need.